southern states. The day of us passed away would be our national holiday. Inside your typical fast food joint, ketchup goes on a hamburger and not on the workers behind the counter. So what made this woman so mad? Yes, a lady came in and wanted to use more than one coupon. She had about 12, but our policy is only one per customer. That's right. It was all over coupons. The worker, a teenager who did not want to appear on camera, says the customer was persistent. She kept bothering me, kept asking, and I kept telling her I couldn't do it. So then she decided to get upset. Before she left, she said she's going to have her daughter come up here. And that's exactly what happened. Later that afternoon, police say these three women entered the restaurant, approaching the teen and yelling, oh, you're the one, and don't ever disrespect my mom. That's when one decided to up the stakes. She reached over the counter, threw the sugar at me first, and then she reached over the counter again and threw the plastic thing that's for the ketchup. But throwing condiments apparently wasn't enough. And the girl pushed past my manager and began punching me several times in my face. The first hit hurt, but the other ones didn't. Police are hoping this video will help them serve up an arrest with a side of battery and disorderly conduct charges. For one, fighting over coupons is stupid, and for two, wrong place, not the right place, and plus I'm a minor compared to you, so that's just different. Now the girl tells me she works at Burger King every day after school to have enough money to pay for car insurance. We're told the value of those coupons less than two dollars. Guys. At Burger King, you can have it your way. As long as you remember one thing. Don't make the black kids angry. IHOP. McDonald's. Burger King, morning, noon, night. We have so many episodes of black mob violence in these public spaces. Do you think a business can survive having this stuff happen in, inside in their establishment? So a large group of black people are in this restaurant, destroying, fighting, cursing, threatening. Cop comes in. I think somebody got sprayed in the face with mace. And all of a sudden, everybody gets indignant as if there's no reason for anybody to get sprayed in the face with mace. Are we getting punked? Is Ashton, Ashton Kutcher like off screen laughing at us? 
com- this is a comedy. But it's really a big part of the story of relentless black victimization that we get every day, which is the greatest lie of our lifetime, which we're exposing here. And on that scintillating bestseller, don't make the black kids angry. When we hear Michelle Obama talking about food deserts, she means that in black neighborhoods, there are very few grocery stores And what stores there are, usually these small convenience or liquor stores, often where everything is, or at least the workers, are hidden behind these thick plates of plexiglass. The cops often do not even respond to reports of shoplifting. So crime against these stores in these areas is is just at astronomical levels, no surprise. But some people are taking it to a new level, the crime in these places to a new level. And we're going to give you three examples of that right now. It starts with a guy in a crowbar trying to jimmy his way into this liquor store. Eventually, the front door is shattered and the four crooks rush inside, dragging trash cans with them. They head for the premium alcohol, quickly throwing bottles into the trash cans. This isn't the first joint these thieves have reportedly hit in recent weeks. They're all donning unique outfits and their faces are fairly hidden. These guys look like they know what they're doing. They do. They, they're professionals. I, I've never seen people, the hole was like this big, I couldn't even get into it. And they were fast. Yeah. Four minutes, less than four minutes they were in here. All we really know about this smash and grab at this liquor store is that it happened in Detroit. If you look at the gloves, if you look at the masks, if you didn't know it was in Detroit, if you didn't know who it was, we'd have to say, well, gosh, I don't know if those people are black or not, even though that is a black neighborhood and a black city. Even so, that's different than saying, I know those people in that store are black. But I'm including that clip in this in, in, in this spirit. I'm including it in the spirit of, if there are white people, if this turns out to be white people marauding through a liquor store in a black neighborhood in Detroit, or if it's Chinese people, or if it's people from India or Pakistan or Korea or Mexico, I say that'll be the biggest story of the story of the year. So why don't we just put that? So I'll put that story here just to say. Hey, this turns out to be somebody other than black people. Let's jump on that story, too. Now, why don't we head over to Philadelphia? A couple of young ladies take uh, the shoplifting to a new level. They also steal some stuff in a uh, 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 kind of a liquor slash convenience store. It's more of a convenience store called Five Below. They, They get confronted outside the store. They stab the clerk in the neck and in the back. And the Philadelphia Police Department release on this, they said they found these two images on social media. Wow, that, that, that raises about a million more questions than it answers. Like, what's their names? What are the links to these pages? Why are, you know, wh- how did you find those? How did you find these links to social media? Guess we'll know the answers to those questions soon enough. Let's head down to a, a suburb of Atlanta where a shoplifter took his shoplifting to a new level. Then he took his resistance to the security guard to a new level by killing him. Well, Vinny, police are searching for that suspect who they say killed a 25-year-old loss prevention officer here at this Walmart in Lilburn off the 400 or 4,000 block of Lawrenceville Highway. They say that his name is just Ramey Dion Ferguson, or JD, and he had only worked here for about seven months. Now, they have released an image that of the person that they are looking for. They are saying that he's described as a dark-skinned black male, uh, medium build, maybe 5'9 to 5'10 between 
the age of 30 and 45. They say he appears to be bald and has at least maybe a short haircut and no facial hair. Now, they say he was wearing some sort of gray denim button-up shirt with dark-colored pants. Lilburn police uh, say that the suspect tried to steal three flat-screen televisions from this Walmart. It happened last night around 9, and they say that Ferguson, that loss prevention officer, and another person tried to stop the man as he was in the lobby area before he made that final exit. And they say after some sort of quick confrontation or struggle, the suspect pulled out a pistol and fired at least one round that eventually killed the victim. I had a guy leave a comment this morning on one of my other YouTube videos. Said, Colin, you got to talk faster. Your videos are too slow. Talk faster. We got to talk to the millennials. They don't have attention. So we got to go real short. Yeah, yeah, he's probably right. But I'm talking as fast as I can. I only do these on one take. I mean, I don't go back and do 26 takes and pick the best one. Because we got to churn out as many of these as we can. Because the mountain of denial is so enormous. The mountain of denial, deceit, delusion is so enormous about the, about the amount of black on white crime, black mob violence, black criminality, that I think the only way we're going to chip away at it is through lots and lots and lots of videos. So really, when I look at these videos, I say, yeah, you know, I could put each one of these things should probably take three days. I should probably do one every three days instead of three in one day. That's really just not going to get the job done in drawing attention to this enormous problem with black mob violence, black on white crime, and and the relentless and the, re, the the biggest lie of our generation, how black people are relentless victims of relentless white racism all the time, everywhere. That explains everything, especially why cops are always picking on black people and in, in, in for no reason whatsoever. So I appreciate the film critics out there that say we could these things could come out better. Yeah, if I had if we all had the time, I would go back and spend the rest of the day editing the video audio, taking out all my little stammers and stutters and I'm gonna go back and restart a sentence because I didn't like the way the sentence started in the first place. Who knows? Maybe someday we'll have a staff of twenty six people around here and I'll just you know, they'll all be in a big room, right? And I'll have this like riding crop and I'll be like walking up and down the desks. And if I, you know, have to see somebody editing a video and if they're not doing it quickly enough or the way I want it done, I'll just slap them on the wrist with the riding crop. Yeah. That would be that would be the best way to get these videos in shape. But until we get there, here's what you have to do. Share these videos, like them, subscribe to this channel. I know a lot of people are going to resist this. I know that. I don't worry about the 20% of the people that no matter what happens, they are absolutely not going to buy into this whole thing. Listen, we just did a story down in Washington, D.C. where a guy was beaten almost to death by 20 black people on a hiking and biking trail called the Washington Branch Metro Trail. Washington Metro Branch Trail. He wrote a big story and read it about how he was, you know, how he was sorry for the people who did it and how they should have, they didn't, why they think, why they pick on him when they should have been picking on someone like Romney and Trump who's responsible for their plight in life. Those people are beyond convincing. If getting the hell beat out of you doesn't convince you, then watching a few videos, even if there's th documented thousands of examples of this, that's not going to help either. But there's a lot of people in the middle that, that they're not really resistant to it. They're just not overly enthusiastic about being convinced about it. That's what these videos are for. That's why I want you to share and like them, subscribe to this channel, tell people about it. And I'm working on that room with the 27 video and audio editors in it with my writing crop. I think I'll add a cigar to that. I'm sure the videos will get way better. Then, until then, just remember one thing. Maybe this is extra important if you own, a, if you're a businessman in a black neighborhood. Don't make the black kids angry. But sometimes you gotta piece together these stories like jigsaw puzzles. That's what this was. So a black guy walks into a subway in Sacramento, California, 
tries to get a sandwich. For some reason, they didn't want to sell him a sandwich. Maybe he didn't have the money. I don't know. Nobody knows. Whatever happened, pretty soon he came back in with three of his fellas. By fellas, I mean one chick. And uh, these four black people with baseball bats and trash cans proceeded to break out the windows, attack the owner, attack the manager. And I don't think they ever got their sandwich. Um, But I think uh, I just checked and down at the county lockup, they're having bologna, cheese and lettuce this evening. Just another case of black mob violence in the otherwise bucolic town of Sacramento, California. So if you ever get hungry in Sacramento, maybe you want to give that Subway sandwich shop a miss. Head downtown. That's where all the lobbyists hang out. That's where they take care of all the business. And, you know, I think the place is called Fat City. That's what it was called, at least when I was going to Sacramento. It's the home of that famous quote by the famous Democrat politician of California, Jesse Unruh, who said, if you can't take their money, take their money, screw their women, and then turn around and vote against them the next day, you don't have any business being there. So go check. So that's two pieces of advice. One, check out Fat City. Get one of their bowls of uh, Chinese noodles. And two, don't make the black kids angry.
I know we're going to be friends, too, because I like to do everything boys and girls like to do. <laughs> when it comes to eating those delicious McDonald's hamburgers. A magic tray here keeps me well supplied. McDonald's hamburgers, french fries, and milkshakes. Watch for me on TV. They don't wreck their business. They'll have lots of fun. favorite place in town. It's a good time for the great. I love it when people start their own YouTube channels exposing black on white crime, black on Asian crime, black on gay, black on young, black on old, black on woman, black on man. Crime. I'm surprised more people don't do it. You know, if you want to start your own YouTube channel, there's probably 10 or 20, probably more police stations in the country that have their own YouTube channels. There's all this video on there. We don't do nearly enough on it, but there's just a ton of videos out there just like this one. Outside of Starbucks, downtown Philadelphia, co hot coffee in the face, black on white assault. We get a lot of comments on this channel, almost a thousand a day. Seems like every time we run a story like this, there's always one or two people go, Colin, what caused that? Why did that happen? Well, you know what? I don't give a damn. I only care about two things. One, in places like Philadelphia and all the rest of the country, black on white violence is wildly out of proportion. And two, the only thing the reporters will tell you, they'll whisper to you, the only thing the reporters and the police officials will tell you as a way to avoid it is don't make the black kids angry. At some point, all of the racial violence we document on this channel and in all of my books, it goes from being serious to ridiculous. Here are two recent examples from black mob violence in restaurants. Hi, this is Colin Flaherty. I'm the author of Don't Make the Black Kids Angry. Here we talk about black mob violence, black and white crime, and the greatest lie of our generation, the hoax of black victimization. All without racism, without rancor, without apology. So I get a lot of stuff from Chicago, most of which I don't use because it's kind of too easy there. But this I got from a Chicago cop who also does a lot of work as a security guard, uh, a doorman, in Chicago restaurants, downtown Chicago, at the uh, magnificent mile all the upscale restaurants down there the T I think, I think he I think he actually does time at TGI Fridays I don't think that'll expose him too much but he's always he's always telling me that there's always fights there's always complaints there's always big arguments among bl almost exclusively black people and um, the end result of which is people sometimes rather large groups of people storm out of the restaurant without paying. That's what happened here in this Chicago Denny's when a large group of people came in, large, four, five, six, something like that. They came in for some uh, all-you-can-eat pancakes for $4, and um, they were quite unhappy to learn that it was $4 per person. Loud argument, big fight ensued, 
bunch of people got arrested. Just another day in just another Chicago restaurant. Let's head over to Chuck E. Cheese's for some more frivolity. Maybe this is a good time for a reminder to all the trolls out there. Every one of these videos is a challenge. A challenge to you, troll. I say this is wildly out of proportion. This kind of black behavior is wildly out of proportion compared to whites or compared to Asians who do it. So all you have to do is start producing some videos of white people getting into fights at Denny's because of the $4 all-you-can-eat pancakes then running out without paying the $4. Or large groups of white people getting into large fights at Chuck E. Cheese. I'll warn you, the, the second one's going to be a little difficult because I was I kind of had this video that I went to look for it again, so I put in, went to Google, Chuck E. Cheese large fight. Um... I didn't find this one, but I did find a lot of other stuff. So that's your challenge. Find some videos. We've done a lot of videos exposing a lot of black mob violence. And when I ask for videos of white people doing it, Asian people doing it, for some reason it's always like kryptonite. Even so, if you're in Denny's or in Chuck E. Cheese, I just remind you of one thing. Where is my Starbucks barista now that I need her? Black person in Chicago shot a couple of more black people in Chicago outside of the Starbucks. All this in a, one died. All this in a neighborhood where, you know, that's not really supposed to happen. I'm kind of surprised it happened here. That doesn't happen around here in Chicago. One of those deals. I wish my, I wish I had a barista to go to that could explain this to me. A woman shot and killed as she walked out of a Starbucks. Police say she was the innocent victim of gang gunfire. Tonight, as word spreads about her death, neighbors of Yvonne Nelson are devastated. Chicago's top cop calls this an example of just how brazen violent offenders have become in this city. What is also alarming is where the shooting happened. 35th and State, a very busy area, and that's just steps from the ITT campus. And only a couple of blocks from police headquarters, and it's also near U.S. Cellular Field. Eyewitness News reporter Eric Hong picking up the story. He's live at Sturger Hospital tonight where that woman died. Eric. Kathy and Ron, Yvonne Nelson worked as a City of Chicago 311 operator. And tonight her family tells us she was on her way home from work when she decided to stop for some coffee. Tonight, distraught family members gathered at Stroger Hospital. Their loved one, Yvonne Nelson, remembered as a caring soul. But this is a hard hit um, and will be a void in this family. So we're just going to ask everyone to remember them in your prayers. Nelson was killed in the middle of the afternoon, just two blocks from police headquarters and less than half a mile from U.S. Cellular Field. Just, uh, just really 
the uh, headquarters building and I've stayed about six days shot. Nelson was caught in crossfire, police say, as a man was shot multiple times. She had just left this Starbucks. I just remember her just kind of like hanging out, just waiting, you know, to get her a drink. One minute she's there and then obviously the next minute she's not, she's not even alive. This incident right here highlights what I've been saying for the last month and a half about how brazen uh, these violent offenders are. We know that the intended target is a documented gang member. The 49-year-old Bronzeville resident worked for the city of Chicago as a 311 operator at OEMC, which in a statement said Yvonne Nelson was a dedicated and hardworking employee. She will be deeply missed by her fellow staff at 311. Imagine if it was your sister. Imagine if it was your mother. And what would you need during this time of grief? Um, you'll need a word of encouragement. You'll need a hug. Sorry, Reverend. We are way past hugging this one out. Chicago is now a town where the bad guys are considered the good guys and the good guys are considered the bad guys. I know we can trot the new police chief out there and say he's outraged at these brazen criminals doing all these bad things. Surprise, surprise, surprise. That's what he says. That's not what his bosses on the city council are saying. Whenever they talk about black criminality, they're never talking about the damage that is done. They're always talking about how the black criminals are the victims of relentless white racism all the time, everywhere. That explains everything, especially why cops in Chicago are always picking on black people for no reason whatsoever. You know what? That sounds kind of goofy, right? That's almost word for word what the, what the mayor's commission said just like a month ago. Now people wonder why all of a sudden this black crime, this black on white crime, this black criminality, this black mob violence that used they used to that was the conceit. I don't know I don't know if it was ever true. The conceit was, well, it's all just a bunch of drug dealers shooting each other down on the south side. That's not true anymore. Now people in Chicago are starting to panic. How common this crime is, how easy it is to dismiss. How many, how so many people, how so many reporters and public officials ignore, deny, condone, excuse, encourage, and even lie about it. Just a couple days ago, the Chicago Sun-Times did a big story about a Chicago area resident who was attending the University of Iowa. That's the black guy who was walking around on video, starting fights, started three fights. Somebody somebody punched him up a bit in self-defense next day he wakes up and decided it was all racism all of his family all the reporters everybody in chicago and, and at iowa so what a bad bad thing that was well they figured out pretty soon that guy was lying his ass off then comes the chicago sun times the guy does a story on it saying a column saying well you know maybe we shouldn't lie about that because we have so many other cases of white on black violence to support our cause that white racism is everywhere and that explains everything, especially why white people are always attacking black people for no reason whatsoever. That is a lie. Man, I think I need a latte. Yeah, skim milk, extra whip, could you put it in put in another dose, please, of don't make the black kids angry? Back in the day, editors would decide what went in a paper and where it went. Basically just kind of off their instincts and guts, they'd all meet once in the afternoon and they would all make these these decisions. Well, compared to what we know today, what they were doing was basically guesswork. Because today we know how many, you know, how often people read these stories. That we know, we know how long they read these stories or watch these videos. So it's really kind of a science today. Even so, when I saw this story out of Memphis, a bunch of black people in an IHOP having a big uh, episode of black mob violence. Uh, I mean, I thought, okay, I'll put it aside, and if I get a few more like it, I'll I'll do a video on it. Then I start getting all these emails. I've got like 20 emails going, Kyle, Kyle, what about that IHOP video? Maybe it's the baby.
Burger King, Waffle House. We just did one of these stories the other day down in Macon, Georgia, where at the end of the story, the young lady reminded us, oh, yeah, the cops say this kind of thing is not unusual. Hey, is anybody else here hungry all of a sudden? So I'll meet you at the IHOP. If you get there ahead of me, order me the Don't Make the Black Kids Angry special. In a 
perfect world of perfect objectivity, we wouldn't have favorite stories of black violence and denial. But I'm sorry, I just can't help but smile very broadly whenever I think about what Starbucks did last year. Remember when they started that big campaign, Conversations on Race, and how long that lasted? How many days that lasted? One, two, or three before they closed it all in? I think a lot of I think a lot of uh, customers were saying, hey, what's up with all this black crime and violence? I don't think Starbucks liked that. But I also knew that at some point after, the, after that big conversation on race, Starbucks was going to have a lot more questions they could not or did not want to answer. What about this little episode in Chicago? Customer goes in, gets a little coffee, comes out and gets killed. How about this episode in Philadelphia? Stop at this center city Starbucks at 16th and Arch turned into a violent encounter all caught on video. I found myself looking forward to all these conversations with baristas or at least hearing about them. When people would say, hey, what's up with all this uh, black mob violence and black on white crime and black criminality at Starbucks? What's up with that? And having the baristas explain to us race had nothing to do with it. It was all about a bunch of other stuff. And just because black people were involved in this wildly out of proportion, that is just a coincidence. It's the world's greatest coincidence. That's the kind of stuff you think of when you ingest the world's most popular psychoactive drug, coffee. And oh yeah, it just happened again, this time in Peoria, Illinois. We've got some breaking news in Peoria. That's right. Police right now at the scene of a Starbucks where they're investigating something that went down. Something that went down. When you're a hot chick on local news, that's the kind of stuff you can get away with saying and no one will ever notice. Mark Liverman is live near 75th Avenue in Thunderbird with what we know so far. Good morning, Mark. Good morning. Yeah, what we know so far is this was some type of an armed robbery. It happened around 3.30 this morning, and it happened right here at this Starbucks, we're told. Uh, you can see a number of police cars still on scene. There were a couple more earlier. Those cleared out probably within the last five or ten minutes. But what we know so far, and we haven't been told a lot, uh, there was a safe that was not taken that was inside that Starbucks, uh, but the contents inside the safe, or at least some of them, uh, were taken at gunpoint. Uh, we're told uh, this is an armed robbery, but nobody was injured. That's what they know uh, so far. In terms of suspects, I asked police on scene just a couple minutes ago uh, how many suspects were involved, what they looked like. At this point, they say uh, they don't know. They haven't been able to release that information, and you can actually watch. It looks like possibly one or both of them are now driving off but the investigation of course continues guys and as soon as we get more information we will bring that to you three episodes of black criminality at starbucks all in the last two to three months i think they recently opened a starbucks in ferguson missouri eagerly awaiting news from there as well i've been in a lot of starbucks a lot of times all over the country i've never seen a white person do this oh yeah they did catch up with the guy they caught up with, with his description it indeed was a black person you think it's time for starbucks to reinstitute their little converse conversation on race if so i'd be happy to donate a few copies of that scintillating bestseller that might help the baristas out a little bit don't make the black kids angry. The last time I got in trouble with YouTube happened after I saw a video not too much different than this one. It was out of Pittsburgh. And a little white kid was surrounded by a whole bunch of black people. And uh, if, if you watch the local news, everything was blurred out. So you didn't have any audio, you didn't see any faces, all you saw was, I don't know, you could hardly see anything. But the person on the news was describing this attack, some teens attacked another teen. I got on the phone, called up the mom and said, hey, could you send me that video? They're all one, 
Yeah, as soon as I saw the raw version, it was a thousand times different than the sanitized version on TV. When you strip out the blurring and when you add in the audio, all of a sudden, you saw a scared little kid surrounded by a whole bunch of bigger black kids who were threatening him, taunting him, harassing him until they finally, at the end of the video, beat the hell out of him. Well, YouTube said I was glorifying violence against children. I said I was exposing it. They were completely unimpressed. So I hope I don't get in trouble with YouTube for this one, but you know what? We got to see this. So here's a story about an ice cream guy going through in an ice cream truck in Memphis. A bunch of black people beat him, rob him with a metal baseball bat. Let's compare the TV version with the unedited version. Breaking news this morning, an ice cream truck driver attacked by several men, and it was all caught on camera. We're showing you the video this morning with the hope to get these violent men off the streets. Now, at 6.32 this morning, WMC Action News 5's Jerrica Phillips is live with what she's learned from police about that attack. Jerrica. Well, good morning, Kim. It happened here at the Bella Vista Apartments here in Hickory Hill, and you know it's just a sad day when the ice cream man can't drive through a community on a hot summer day without being beaten and attacked. And this morning, we are learning more about what these guys were after. And apparently, they stole at least $500 from that driver. Now, take a look at this Facebook Live video. It's tough to watch, but in it, you can see a group of men caught on camera assaulting that ice cream truck driver. It happened again here at the Bella Vista Apartments. Memphis police said they were called to the location around 7.20 in the evening on Tuesday. The driver said he was riding in the complex when a man jumped in on the passenger side, attacked him, and caused him to crash his truck into a concrete wall. The video shows several other men using a weapon, possibly a baseball bat, to beat the driver and smash out windows on his truck. Now, this man, the driver, was taken to the hospital with some injuries, but he is expected to be okay. In that video, you eventually see a woman who tries to stop that attack, and the man who is filming, he does nothing. Thing to try to help. If you have. Hey, I'm on guard. Hey, I'm on oh guard. On oh guard. Bro, look, look at this shit. Damn. Damn. On oh guard. Damn, bitch. Daddy. Hell no, fool. Damn! Damn! Is the nigga oh my he's on the ground oh my damn damn fool the mind oh hell no i'm gonna go down there you climb, you climb, you climb. hey go make the help oh my oh my look at this shit Damn. You okay, man? Is you okay? Is you all right? Babe. Damn, I forgot the mind shit on slow. Damn. Last year, we did a video in Memphis 
It was following the large-scale episode of black mob violence at Kroger's grocery store in Memphis. You guys remember that one? A couple of hundred black people were rampaging through a uh, parking lot, grocery store parking lot. They beat up some people in the parking lot. Then they went after the store employees until finally knocking one of them out with a pumpkin. Well, one of the local stations actually found some of the people involved in that and other sorts of criminal mayhem. They said, why do you do it? He said, because we like doing it. That's why. I guess that's the local TV version of asking those criminals. Who made the black kids angry? Schools could have shut us up. They would have a long time ago. I'm not talking about shutting us down. Well, they try that all the time. But it's not really as easy to shut somebody down on YouTube as it seems. But if they could have shut us up, we told them how to do it, right? He said, listen, all you got to do to shut us up is whenever we post an example of a bunch of black people doing a home invasion on an old white lady, all you have to do is give us some counterexamples that white people do it too. Instead, what they do is they come in, they fish up some phony statistic, they drop it on the page, and they say, there, Colin, guess you, guess we showed you. That's why, we're gonna, that's why I'm going to do this video today, because we've got two cases of cooking the books in the last two weeks, one from New York City, one from Washington, D.C., both centers of black violence where it's wildly out of proportion. In New York City, and here's the way it works, by the way. When Obama took office seven and a half years ago, one of the first things he did was put out a little memorandum, executive order, telling people that this whole prison to cradle pipeline wasn't really working for him anymore. Because everybody knows that arresting people is what causes crime. So he said, we've got to stop arresting people. We've got to cut that way down. So they started doing that. In Baltimore, the arrests went from 100,000 a year to 50,000 a year. When, when de Blasio took office, I think it was the beginning of, la was it the beginning of last year, 2000. Anyway, anyway um, when he took office, uh, Harry Belafonte came up and gave a big speech. And he said what a bad person Bloomberg was because they were arrested so many black people for no reason whatsoever. The day after the speech, Bloomberg's top assistant came out in the New York Post or Times, one of the papers, and said, oh yeah, by the way, we reduced the number of our arrests by 30 to 40% over the last couple of years. So everybody's, everybody's down with it. The code word is, we're not going to arrest our way out of this mess. Well, if you drop the number of arrests, what happens to your crime rate? That goes down, especially in schools. I mean, to get a kid, I mean, people, I mean, there's all sorts that we've seen, we've documented here with video, the enormous amount of violence, mayhem, chaos in, in black schools throughout the country. Yet, as we'll see in this, in this New York Post article, the teachers all over the country are, un, are under enormous pressure to keep the crime numbers down. Don't report the crime. Keep the numbers down. We don't want to criminalize the child because arresting children for really serious crimes, that causes crime. So here we come from, here we come up to New York. The mayor is out there on the stump somewhere, Mayor de Blasio, bragging about the success of all his crime initiatives and in schools. The New York Post comes out and tells the truth about it. He's using bogus numbers. The teachers say they're using bogus numbers. I'll let you read the article here if you like. Same thing down in Washington, D.C. The chief of police in Washington, D.C. gave a press conference just a couple days ago. She said robberies were down 20%. The reporter goes, oh, uh, Madam, Madam uh, Chief of Police, Madam Chief, uh, I think robberies are up, up 20%. And he was right. So there was a gap of 40% between what the chief thought said was happening and what was really happening. Well, one thing about both of these articles that, 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 that one thing both of these articles really shows 
is that crime statistics are not like baseball statistics. You get a hit or a run or an error, click, 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 it goes into a nice, neat little box. Everybody knows what the numbers are. And a guy comes along and says, hey, you're looking at the wrong numbers. You ought to look at these numbers, not those numbers. Remember that book and movie Moneyball? That's what that was about. So everybody loves the numbers. Okay, I get that. But the numbers, the crime numbers are not, it's not big. crime numbers are not like hit run, hits, runs, and errors. I mean, a robbery, a, rob- a robbery can be pretty much anything you want it to be. It could be a strong arm robbery. It can be a felony. It can be a misdemeanor. It all depends what the chief is telling the officers that week. We documented that on White Girl Bleed a lot and Don't Make the Black Kids Angry. Chicago Magazine did a two, huge two-part series on how they cooked the books in Chicago. New York Times, front page story, how they cooked the books in New York. How you basically have to, you know, kind of like deliver a cop with a signed confession, deliver a criminal with a signed confession to the cops before they take a police report. The, the pressure to get the numbers down is enormous. And, and, and just so, the, just so the, the, the mayor and the police chief can walk around and wave to the crowds and take and, and, and try to convince a couple of reporters that their city is a lot safer than it actually is. Okay, you've had your vegetables. Here comes the dessert. Recent story of large-scale black mob violence at a Chuck E. Cheese. Forty black people were fighting. Let's get some details. Then at the end, we'll run a video from uh, some large-scale black mob violence at a Chuck E. Cheese. Police in the Twin Cities are looking for a fourth suspect related to that fight involving about 40 people last week that happened at a Bloomington Chuck E. Cheese. Three suspects shown here have already been arrested. 23-year-old Nevin Funches, 24-year-old Antoine Smith, and 24-year-old Demetrius Moore were all arrested last week. All three are facing charges of mob action. Smith also faces reckless conduct, conduct, while Funches faces aggravated battery of a child in reckless conduct. The Bloomington police do need the public's help to find this man, 27-year-old Lawrence Johnson. He goes by the nickname Thune. He's wanted for mob action. So here's the deal. People send me videos from a Chuck E. Cheese and there's no date on it. I can't tell which Chuck E. Cheese it is. So I just have to look at it and say, have I seen this one before? Because, you know what, we might miss a couple of videos here and there. We're not missing any Chuck E. Cheese videos, that I guarantee you. Anyway, this one had a real distinctive part in it that as soon as I saw it, I said, oh yeah, we've seen this one before. I call that the Chuck E. Hop. Once you see it, you don't don't really forget it. Now, if we can just get the mayors of Washington, D.C. and New York to uh, treat their crime numbers the same way that we treated this video here, that is, once you see the crime numbers, once you get them right, you don't really forget them. And so they can stop worrying about how to make the black kids angry.